Good morning. Happy Wednesday to everybody. Here we are again, another Coffee with the Farmer and, this, and Resource Manager. And this morning we have a great guest who's a longtime friend, Alec Wasson. And his company is called Idea Farming. And he's going to tell you a lot more about what idea farming is and what he does in the agriculture industry. And I think a lot of you are going to find this very interesting because he's a pretty creative guy and he has figured out a way to take his passion and his creativity and make a company out of it and work in agriculture. So as we normally do, do in the mornings, we do a little round robin around the state and ask a quick question to kind of get us primed for the day. As many of you know, yesterday, no matter, well, I don't know, in the Central Valley, maybe it wasn't where you are, but in the Central Valley, it was the hottest day of the year so far. Here in the Woodland Sacramento area, it was 92. So the question is for all of you staff, what did you do yesterday to cool yourself down or to just do something to prepare yourself for the heat that is obviously coming? So I'm Mary Kimball, I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Land-Based Learning. And what I did is turn on fans in every single room. <laughs> so it was the first day where I had the fans really going uh, and, it, and it felt, it got, me, got me through especially the afternoon. So that's about all I can do right now. I don't have a pool and uh, nowhere else to go to, to get into a pool. So that was that. All right, Dana, you're up. Good morning, I'm Dana Baker, the Tehama County Farms Leadership Coordinator. So coming from Red Bluff, and yes, yesterday was the hottest day we've had so far. Um, I think it did hit 93. And um, kids and I had weren't home a whole lot of the day because we had taken the goats to get bread. But when we did get home in the afternoon, the sprinklers went on. My kids built a, what they call a water park. It's a little miniature blue kiddie pool that that we've you know taped and then the sprinkler and they get the water balloons filled up um so that and i have to confess that i even kicked the air conditioner on while everybody was trying to get wound down into bed because it was pretty warm we have a two-story house and upstairs i think my it was like 89 in my son's room <laughs> so um so we did do that but the heat is going to come and that was just the beginning just the beginning all right, Joseph. Good morning, my name is Joseph Montoya. I'm the Farms Leadership Coordinator for the Sacramento Valley. I actually spent most of my late afternoon working. Um, I was just sort of in the zone and I just like closed all the blinds and windows and it was all <laughs> cold, like cooler in here. Uh, and that's what I did. Uh, to my knowledge, um, the wife and the almost three-year-old spent most of the day outside in swimsuits She's got a little uh, tub or a little, you know, blow up pool that she's in and she loves, she's, she's a little water baby. So, you know, any kind of water, she's just all in it. That's perfect. Sounds great. I wish I could do that. <laughs> ah, all right, Katie. Good morning. My name is Katie Wartman. I'm coming to you from Fresno. Um, so yeah, it's hot here. It was um, 89 yesterday. Um, in the morning, we kind of used the um, cooler air um, and about by noon we were done and so we went inside we did kick on the air conditioner um, kind of kept everything closed um, uh, just to keep everything cool um, and we've been cooking and baking so that doesn't help um, <laughs> No, the baking but, definitely doesn't. But we're, we're, you know, we're just embracing this whole extra time with at home. Um, and today's going to be 94. Um, and so with the rest of the week looks pretty um, co much cooler and it'll be, it'll feel like heaven. So um, I'm just, we have to get through today. Yes. All right, Romy. Good morning, my name is Romy Wattenbarger. I'm the Kern County Farms Coordinator here in Bakersfield. And it is super hot today. It's a little humid, so I'll usually just, I'm working today with the goats. So I've been in the barn and we have a bunch of big fans and all the lights are off, so I'll just go stand in there and cool off or run the hose down my back, just get a quick chill and just keep going, so. Perfect. It's getting hot, so I'm not ready. Yeah, <laughs> stay cool. That's the best. <laughs> All right, Letty, was it hot in Salinas? 
I That's feel wild. so bad, guys, because <laughs> our high was 72 yesterday. Yeah, and whatever. the one thing I did was wear shorts. Um, it's kind of funny, though. The kids think this is hot. And so I take them outside. And they're like, it's hot. They can only be out there for maybe 20 minutes or something. And of course, um, we're making <laughs> lemonade with our lemons and uh, making sure we're staying hydrated. And sunscreen, of course. Yeah, perfect. Well, that's a perfect segue to our guest, Alec Waslin, because I actually met Alec first on the Central Coast, a uh, friend of my sister's in Aromas, and, and he, of course, lived there for a while as well, so he knows, Letty, all about the, the hot, the yeah. heat, and when they moved, he and his daughter moved to Sacramento, it was like, oh my God, how are we going to do this? They've, they've adjusted well. So, Alec, uh, it's great to have you as part of Coffee with a Farmer Resource Manager because, number one, because we go back a ways and, and I know a little bit or know a lot about what you do, but I think that it'll be great for the students and others to hear your story of how you got into agriculture and how, again, you had created something from the passion that you have about telling stories for ag. So, with that, I'm going to have you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your, your background and uh, kind of how you got to where you are today. Yeah, well, well thank you for having me. Um, well, I was born in Iowa. I don't know how far back you want to go, uh, <laughs> but I actually, <laughs> I, mean, I mentioned that because my family all are farmers. They all grew up, um, uh, my whole family is all uh, central Illinois and uh, they all, uh, you know, had corn and uh, sheep and hogs and, you know, kind of did the whole central Illinois farm experience. And then uh, my dad was the first one from the family to, to go off and, and go, to, go to school and um, got into marketing in the ag side. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of led to our progression west uh, that I, I moved to Colorado, right? I mean, when I was probably a month old, we moved to Colorado and then he was working uh, with the sheep association in Denver and then um, then he moved to Modesto California to uh, run the almond board and mm -hmm. so we continued moving west uh, he ended up uh, on the coast uh, with the strawberry commission mm -hmm. and then that's what brought me to California I, I grew up here since I think fifth or sixth grade in Modesto uh, and then I went to school at Chico mm -hmm. uh, and I did organizational communications and uh, when I was there, I spent an, uh, a summer interning here in Sacramento with uh, California Grown. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of my first experience in the ag uh, commodity board landscape. So we started working with every commodity board. They're promoting the California brand. Uh, that's kind of where I first started what ended up being kind of an ongoing uh, theme for my career of promoting uh, the farmers, telling their stories, and, and really taking pride in knowing where your food comes from, because that's a big part of the California Grown. You want to know, you know, who's growing your food. You want to support your local economy and, and the, the people that are hiring and working in your own neighborhood and state. Um, from there, after college, I went to the, uh, the California Wine Institute, and I worked in their uh, international marketing department, uh, and again, it was promoting California wines, uh, both internationally. I was working on a project to promote California internationally, but also uh, we worked on a project for building, I think it was a brochure and kind of a whole system for when visitors come to California to explain the California wine industry and how to move about the different regions and all that. Um, and then, oh, and then... Uh, I, I was here in Sacramento and I worked for the Chilean Fresh Fruit Association uh, for a couple of years and that was doing the marketing for the whole country of Chile. All fresh fruit that comes in during our winter time, uh, we would do the marketing and, um, and work with retailers. A lot of that was around uh, merchandising and promoting the Chilean logos. And, uh, and that one I was always okay with because I didn't see it as competition with our local farmers. Off season, um, yeah, for sure. I had the, uh, the avocados got a little dicey, but that was the only one that we didn't promote. They have their own whole Chilean Avocado Association. Um, and I know they're kind of at odds all the time with us, but, um, but our fresh fruit, we were, we were just marketing and promoting that. Uh, and then I was, from there I left, mostly just because I was, I was younger and I wanted to Mm -hmm. live in a big city. I moved to San Francisco um, 
and started doing high tech sales for a couple years. Um, but then from there ended up back down in uh, Aptos, kind of Santa Cruz, uh, Watsonville area is where I ended up settling down. And that was around the time that I started working with my dad again. So again, he'd been doing agriculture for his entire career, uh, worked with basically and actually had managed almost every commodity board at some point. And so he had a, he had a, a lot of connections and a lot of understanding and experience around commodity boards. So um, it was around, uh, is in maybe in 2006 that the, uh, the tomato industry had reached out to him because a lot of the tomato industry, um, all, all the farmers that grow tomatoes also uh, grow almonds. And so they had been aware of his work with the almond board back in the 90s. And, uh, and we, we referenced the almond board a lot in our work because uh, it, was a, it was there in the 90s that the almond board uh, really revolutionized how they market um, almonds and, and it became the model that every commodity board now uses in finding out what is the health benefit of your product mm -hmm. tell that to customers because you know in the 90s especially I guess I think people were like being health conscious they wanted to you know find out what they could eat on their way to the gym and <laughs> up till then uh, you know almonds had been considered the fatty nut they, they didn't you know they were delicious but nobody had any reason why you would purposely eat them and they found they did all this funding uh, to do research and they found out that actually it um, high in protein it lowers cholesterol it has all these great benefits to you and so that was kind of the start of a lot of like I mean again almost every commodity commodity board now or any food in general like everybody's telling you why you should eat this product or that product and some of them are a little a bit of a reach but, uh, but the almond board really kind of kickstarted that. So the tomato industry said, hey, why don't we do this? Why don't we have, they're one of the only commodities that doesn't have a federally, uh, a federal checkoff program. Mm -hmm. And so I, I actually helped, I was still working in San Francisco at the time, but I came to that initial kickoff meeting in Davis uh, to, to create the Tomato Products Wellness Council. And so, he kind of got it started. It really, at that point, was really heavily uh, pushing research and science. They would, uh, they had a large, they had a larger budget back then, and they would actually fund giant studies to find out what are the health benefits of tomatoes. Um, and they found out a lot of great things. Tomato products are, are superfood. They literally have um, the most amount of lycopene that you can find that, that fights cancer. It has all these great benefits. Um, so then, when I started working with him full time in 2010 we created a new business called Idea Farming. Uh, and the idea was we're, we're working with farmers, um, but we're promoting the stories, we're telling, uh, we're trying to be creative in how to get that messaging across. And so one of our biggest clients then and to this day was the Tomato Products Wellness Council. And a lot of what we do is um, now on a, on a little bit of a smaller budget, what we're trying to do is figure out ways to help increase consumption of tomatoes because um, as you guys know, uh, it's not a highly profitable um, industry per se uh, in that, uh, you know, it's a challenge. It's, it's tight profit margins. Um, ultimately, the best thing that we can do is, is increase consumption. And that's the best way that we've, we've been able to come up with how to help farmers. And, uh, and we've, been, we've been successful over the years. We've, we've continued to come up with creative ways to help tell those stories. Um, and then that, so again, that was in 2010. Since then, we've, uh, we've worked with almost every commodity board um, doing projects. Uh, we've received grants from the CDFA to do uh, projects for both the Tomato Wellness Council and for the Pistachio Board. Um, we've worked with the Sheep Association. Uh, we've helped do marketing, PR, um, a lot of it has been around social media, um, as you might expect, kind of stereotypically, uh, the ag industry isn't always on the cutting edge of uh, <laughs> some social media trends. And so we've, we've kind of helped um, really kind of lead that. That's, that's one of our biggest uh, successes with Tomato Wellness was that we got our growers, which I, I applaud them. They were so open to this idea back in 2010 when I was pitching to them, hey, we've got to get into Facebook, we've got to get on Twitter, we've got to get on Instagram. I don't know if Instagram was there yet, but um, Not quite. And they were like, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's do it. And we actually got a trip with all of our executive uh, board out to the Google headquarters 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that was really cool because, I mean, it, it's Google and it just had that Google magic. And at that point, um, Google had just bought Wildfire, which was a, a social media platform, promotion platform. Um, and so we got all of our farmers there and they, they got the big presentation from Google and really could see, okay, this, this makes sense. And, and, you know, people were skeptical. I remember one, one person saying, like, how is Facebook going to help me sell more tomatoes? And, uh, you know, and, and people, and, you know, in the industry, there are some people still who don't necessarily use email or, um, you know, and so there are people that are kind of holding out, but I think that by and large people have understood this is the way of the future. And I think that the other thing that I've always really pitched is the fact that, you know, it's been hard over the last 10 years. The industry is not, people aren't just sitting around with uh, extra money right now. And, uh, you know, so for us, at one point, probably around 2012, uh, we had done consumer research. We found out what consumers wanted to know about the industry. And we said, okay, look, we can create a commercial uh, that will run nationwide on TVs across the country. And we believe that this will have an impact on uh, consumption, but it's gonna cost $25 million. Right. And everybody was like, yeah. well, yeah, that, uh, that's, 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 yeah that's, <laughs> that's not great. So then we said, okay, well, how about we spend a fraction of that and we dive into social media. Mm-hmm. And we really hit it hard when we did in probably 2013 or 14. And uh, we, we got in at the right time that we were really able to get, um, you know, a lot of bang for our buck. You know, things have changed drastically in social media, yes. uh, you know, it advertising. A lot more now. On yeah. Like to, <laughs> but back then you could actually post something and all your followers would see it. Now, you know, if you post something and you don't boost it, you might only get a couple hundred views. Yeah. And, uh, and so we were successful in getting in early. And then helping and actually being trained at Google was really beneficial in kind of how to build social media marketing campaigns um, and, and just kind of like helping kind of build our philosophy of how we're going to go out and attack and get our messaging across. Um, it really helped us develop um, just kind of a, a, again, just kind of a great philosophy and how to kind of build out a calendar, um, how to focus on, you know, three or four key topics and then how to work those in so that you're consistent, but you're also having a variety, uh, you know, so you're not seeing yeah, the same so thing do you every want to, day. Do you want to um, show the video now? To, yeah. Because I think that actually would be a perfect example, right? And, you well, can, and after we look at it, watch it together, we can kind of critique or talk yeah. about the different elements. Yeah. Uh, and and just, just before you start, just say who, what this, who this video was done for, and you know maybe real quickly what you were trying to to uh, accomplish with it yeah well and i'll say we so we got a grant from the cdfa which was a mm-hmm. huge boost in the arm um because again we were on a pretty tight budget but what we proposed in our in our grant proposal was we wanted to reach consumers we want to figure out what it's going to take to increase consumption and and what we learned from focus groups all across the country and uh and quantitative qualitative data um Basically, what consumers really want to know is who's growing their food and how does it get from the field to them. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about canned, and tomato wellness is only canned or chopped. And so that kind of has a little bit of an extra. Not super sexy canned tomatoes. (laughs) Not the what? Not super sexy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it, kind of has like a little bit of a negative connotation to it when you just talk about cans. So what we're trying to do is explain, this is a very simple process. It goes from the field to the can in a matter of hours, and then it's whisked away to your favorite restaurant or your favorite grocery store. And uh, and so we really wanted to simplify that process, but we wanted to make it very consumer friendly. We wanted to make it a fun, um, you know, catchy little jingle that would kind of get stuck in your head and make you kind of realize like, oh, cans are great. I enjoy a can. So we came up... (laughs) We came up with this. Um, let me see how to do this. And this was sure. last, was it last year? Um, it was, yeah, it was last, last year, last yeah. summer that, uh, that we came out with this, um, this little cartoon. So oh, yeah. you know, um, we can see it. Yep. Yeah. All right. Oh, there he is. You wake up in the morning, get you that daily grind. Drop the kids to school, 
go to work late at night. That you're dreaming about the fun you had in the sweet old summertime. Swimming pools, barbecues, tomatoes on the vine. Within hours we bring those tomatoes from the field on to your shelf. From the kitchen to the restaurant, taste the freshness for yourself. Tomatoes please, tomatoes please, trucks and trucks of those tomatoes please. Perfect. That is awesome. I know I've seen it several times. So tell us, tell us where this was utilized or we're still being utilized. Um, yeah. How did you get it out there? Well, uh, so again, kind of having to be creative with um, our budget, uh, we, we really utilize social media. We really have utilized um, networking um, within. One of the things that I've, um, I try to do, it's, it's kind of a challenge, is, is working with other associations. And um, uh, I, I found over the last decade, you know, I've been doing this, it, it's, I, I was surprised working among other commodity boards. Sometimes everybody's doing their own thing and there's not a lot of um, kind of sharing or, or uh, collaboration. And so that's one thing I've really tried to do is working with the other boards, other associations, because uh, I feel like it is a win-win whenever we can kind of, you know, share each other's messages or share each other's recipes, things like that. Um, so we, we have been successful in kind of cross promoting it. Um, and then over the course of the last year ish that it's been out, uh, I mean, it's, it's been viewed millions of times. We've used it uh, with a lot of social media campaigns, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and then um, it's on YouTube. And then just through our newsletter list, we've got, um, I think of over 20,000, uh, you know, people on our, on our mailer now. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's getting out there. And again, it's like, it's a real simplified, fun kind of message. You know, it doesn't get into the nitty gritty, but it, it really was just trying to kind of uh, visualize the, the from here to there and just kind of showing them that this isn't, that like, that was the thing that was always frustrating in the, in the focus groups is that people just felt like, uh, you know, canned tomatoes were somehow created in some laboratory, you know, mm -hmm. and, the, and you were like, no, like this is a, this is a farmer that's, you know, a third, fourth generation that's, you know, got his hands in the dirt and, and is, you know, just like any other fruit or vegetable, but, but because it comes in a can, it was as if it was, you know, uh, I don't know, they, they think yeah. that machines made it, uh, you know, and, and it has all these additives and preservatives and all these extra things. It's like, no, that's not, or, you know, uh, that they're, they're GMOs. And it's like, no, there are no GMO tomatoes. There are no GMO it's tomatoes. A, it's not a thing, but <laughs> everyone's just like, so yeah, so there's a lot, we're just trying to like educate people. Um, that's obviously the, the more fun kind of sunshiny version. We've got um, videos where the other thing, you know, that they say is they want to know who's growing their food. So we went out in the fields and we interview, you know, Colin Muller. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a whole series that we, um, that we're really, just trying to show these are the faces of the people that are growing your food. And, and I spent all summer going out and interviewing, um, you know, uh, whether it was the field workers, the managers, the, um, you know, every aspect of the, the chain 
And, and I would always tell them, you know, we don't have any uh, scripts, you know, per se. It was like, really, I just want you to talk about like who you are, what you do. And, and like, and I told them, all I want to do is show you like that you are a human, that these are, these are the people that grow your food. And that, that kind of is a surprise to consumers. And so we just want to help kind of tell that story of. So, and I know one of the things you did, so you do a big focus on consumers, um, but you also, I know, did tours last year, I believe, with a couple of different tomato companies and with restaurateurs. Yeah. Or, or at least folks who are on the food service side of things, not so much the consumer that's going to go to the grocery store. So you have kind of a whole element of your marketing, so to speak, is to talk to, to, talk to them and give them in-person tours. And the other thing that I thought that was really cool, if you could talk about is, I feel like this was in the last year, um, the focus, I think you had some chefs from around the country, like do blind testing of San Marzano tomatoes mm -hmm. from Italy, because that, and you can talk about this, why everybody thinks those are like the end all be all, the most amazing. And then, and, and then compared to California tomatoes yeah. and what one, right? Yeah. So you want to talk about that side of it? Because I think yeah. that there's, there's, it's an interesting, another side of your marketing pieces is, is the different segments of who you're talking to and reaching. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think that, um, you know, and again, a part of it is, um, you know, based on the budget, we kind of realized like, hey, we're not going to reach every consumer in America, but we did, um, you know, for the, for the, consumer side what we really focused on is working with influencers specifically dietitians That's and right. we really built over 10 years we built a really great relationship among uh the dietitian world and and honestly i am really proud of that the mm -hmm. relationships that we have because i think the thing that drives me crazy is you get somebody like tom brady or gwyneth paltrow that tell yep. people don't eat tomatoes because they're a nightshade and they cause uh, inflammation. And it's like, no, like, this is not true. This is not based on any science. And so we go to the registered dietitians who go to college, get a degree, have to do all these steps to become dietitians. We go to them and we say, can you please explain to consumers what the real, what the real deal is? And so we really have a team of great dietitians that we work with to help then write blogs, go on the news, uh, you know, do all the, do all the speaking to consumers for us. Um, and then on the, on the food service side, yeah, we, I, that's always been a big pet peeve of mine. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously of that, you know, you'll hear somebody on TV say, oh yeah, I love canned tomatoes. And it's like, oh great. And then they say, oh, but I only buy imported San Marzano tomatoes. It's like, ah, you just ruined it. And uh, I mean, I would, I would encourage you, uh, especially for people interested in agriculture, there's a good uh, documentary called, um, empire of red gold oh yeah it's kind of controversial but uh and i mean it honestly is kind of trying to be negative on the whole industry but what you see is when they go to china uh you know they see a lot of questions about the process and you know uh, it's it's very questionable then they go to italy and they see the same thing and it's a lot of issues around corruption and labor mm -hmm. um, and they come to the u.s and the biggest thing that they're mad about in the u.s is that we created the harvester back at, you know, Davis in the 60s or 70s. Yeah. And, uh, you know, McKenna is the, the process, which is like, well, that's going to happen in any industry. Um, and, and that, you know, we're, we're into capitalism. And it's kind of like, well, I, I think that those are acceptable versus, you know, corruption and pollution and all the other issues. Anyway, so we, we are very proud of uh, promoting USA tomatoes. And I think that the thing that surprises people is um, that the, when you do a blind taste test and compare Italian versus uh, USA tomatoes, nine out of 10 times, you're gonna choose USA tomatoes. And, and the reason we haven't gone too far with like really trying to blow this up into this huge blind taste test debate is because ultimately people are gonna have their own favorite and, and we completely get that. If your grandma grew up, if you grew up and your grandma always made Sunday sauce and she always used this brand, you're always gonna choose that brand. Like we're not, we're not trying to like change everyone's mind of what they think, but we do take exception when uh, an influencer on a, a cooking show or something tells all of their followers, oh, you have to buy this brand or th from this country, which is yeah. a pretty big blanket statement to make of uh, somehow being a higher quality product. So yeah. it, it's just marketing. It's like everything from Italy is sexy, like shoes and cars and apparently tomatoes. 
But well, I had, I had a, friend, a friend of mine once, and I want to talk to a cotton person about this. Um, you know, she's like, why do we, why are we get so like overblown about Egyptian cotton? Mm -hmm. Like you start looking at the labor, you would want to talk about regulatory and labor issues mm -hmm. in Egypt. <laughs> yeah. Okay? And why, why do we spend all this money or Turkish cotton or whatever that that's the end all be all. And, and it's like, wait a second, let's, let's at least think about some of these decisions we're making about why do we think that's the best. Yeah. And so I think that's part of what you are talking about there. You're not, it's just about questioning it. It's just about asking some more questions. Well, it's just and, about getting, like you said, some, some actually some professionals, like some dietitians and others to say, you know, wait a second, let's look at the science. Let's, let's talk about this just because somebody famous says, uh, don't eat tomatoes because they're nightshades does not mean that that is true at all we need to as consumers in general we need to make sure that we're looking at 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 all of the information that's out there and really thinking critically mm -hmm. and that's something that we talk about with our students across the state it's very easy to look at headlines it's very easy to to get somebody famous that you like and you think okay that that person must be right because i love their music okay that you know that's great maybe you love their music but it doesn't mean that everything that they're saying is necessarily right and you know we need to do our own investigation we need to do our own thought process so anyway that just made me think about my friend going what in the world why do we think egyptian cotton or turkish cotton is the best when we have amazing cotton here in california or in the united states and well, we, and it's quality we labor but then on top is like sustainability and uh, global footprint and all that too. It's like, are we really wanting to ship things from across the world when we have it here in our own backyard? That's like right. it just doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. So I think someone asked a question earlier about social media, but I think you answered it, which is, would you say social media was your biggest marketing tactic? <laughs> that was yeah. Alond Alondra Ortiz. Thank you, Alondra, for asking that question. I think he actually hit it. But if there's anything else you wanted to, and maybe what kinds of things are you working on for the future as we close out? Um, yeah, well, I mean, you know, we, we didn't even touch on the uh, the kind of crazy times that we're living in right now. Before, but yeah, what are you doing during quarantine? It, like, is it, there some new messaging yeah, that you're working on? <laughs> it, it's made things a little bit harder. Like, I, um, I had a hard time this year. Usually I'm out there in the fields when they're doing the transplant. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and part of what has changed for me specifically, not necessarily the industry, is I'm kind of just trying to stay out of the way a little bit. Like, this is kind of a hectic time and like I was bugging I was calling Colin Muller and he was connecting me to some of his guys to do um some transplant videos and I could just tell they were like this don't, is not a great time fun. like they please don't bug us right now and it was just like all right all right and, and so we're we're trying to adapt um you know a lot of what we do is content creation uh you know so it's been easy for us to do a whole new series that's called RD Pantry Chats uh, where we're going out twice a week and we're talking to dietitians across the country on Facebook Live, just telling people how to use their pantry products. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that's changed, obviously, is uh, all the restaurants are closed. Food service is taking a huge hit right now. Mm -hmm. And so while my half of my client or half of my members are um, on the on the retail side, which is actually they're selling out consistently, like they can't keep tomatoes on the shelf. Um, the food service side is really struggling and there's a lot of questions about how any of this is going to go forward so one of the things that we're really trying to have a priority on right now is continuing to uh, support the restaurant industry however we can and telling our consumers and all of our followers hey when you can safely um, try to think about your local restaurants try to think about how you can do delivery or takeout or you know whatever you can do right now because um I know, you know, some of our members that specifically focus on food service, it, it's tough. Um, and I don't know if anybody, no, I mean, I, don't, I know nobody knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're trying to um, juggle because it's, because it is kind of half and half right now for our industry. Um, but yeah, we, we don't know. So we're just trying to, yeah. trying to make people aware, um, you know, not, you know, just how, how to, how to help how you can. 
Well, I think that's a perfect way to end, which is to give us your, uh, since, since you are so strong in social media, to give us some of those, um, whether they're web pages or handles with Twitter or, or Instagram, like you were talking about the pantry, um, the yeah. Facebook live. So just, just, you can shout some of those out now and then, and we'll get those from you too, Alec, and we'll get them out to all of the students who are also, that also listen later to our YouTube videos. We'll make sure to uh, get that information up and we can put it in some of the information that goes actually on the beginning and the end of the YouTube video. Um, but if there's one or two that you want to mention right now, that'd well, be awesome. It's, it's pretty much tomato wellness um, across the board for the tomato industry. Um, on Facebook, I've got Idea Farming, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then our podcast that we do as well as Farm to Table Talk, and that's just Farm to Table Farm Talk. To table talk right. And yeah. then actually, we did our, we did a podcast last week with uh, Aaron Bacellus, who's our chairman for the TPWC, and he does a really good job of talking about what what's happening right now with the quarantine and how they're adjusting as farmers to make sure that their staff is safe and that they're you know, and kind of what the outlook is right now. So that's a, that would be a good one to check out too. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. And we'll make sure to get these all out. Uh, and any, any else, the others that you can think of, you want to send it, you can send it to us, Alec, and we'll, we'll make sure to get it out to everybody. But thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's great to hear from you <laughs> and, and uh, see you, albeit virtually, because mm -hmm. It would have been fun to be at your baby shower since right. you're going to be having a new baby in a couple weeks. But we won't be, we'll just be looking on, on social media to see all those great pictures. So good luck to you and Sarah in the next, next month or so, and, and we'll be in touch. So thanks Thank again. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Yes. Bye.